I'll introduce Ogil when he starts his talk. As for now, Robert is currently a PhD student at Caltech, uh, with uh, working with John Preskill and Thomas Billick. His research focuses on understanding how theory of learning can provide new insights into physics, information, and quantum computing. And most of uh, some of his recent uh, work uh, include uh, understanding classical shadow tomography for large-scale quantum systems and probably efficient machine learning algorithms for solving quantum many uh, body problems. Uh, and today he's going to be talking about foundation for learning from noisy quantum exper experiments. So Robert, uh, please take it away. Uh, very excited about the talk. Yep, thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Robert. Um, today I'll be talking about foundations for learning from noisy quantum experiments. This is a joint work with Steve Flamia and John Presco. So understanding what can be learned from experiments is central to many scientific disciplines. In particular, by obtaining information from experiments, we can understand the physical world and make accurate predictions in different scenarios. In particular, the development of sophisticated quantum technology, as we're all um, pushing towards, relies on knowledge acquired from experiments on quantum systems. So in today's talk, I'll be talking about our recent work where we try to study what can and cannot be learned from noisy quantum experiments by building on learning theory. So for people that are not familiar with learning theory, um, learning theory is a relatively young and vibrant field that tries to understand the power and fundamental limitations in learning and making predictions. It's a, it's, it's a field that has been developed uh, roughly like less than 40 years. And it builds on um, tools in information theory, in complexity theory, and in probability theory in order to understand these kind of questions about learning. So in today's talk, in order to study what can be learned from noisy quantum experiments, we will build on tools from their quantum counterparts, that is quantum information theory, quantum complexity theory, and quantum probability theory in order to answer some of the fundamental questions. So today's talk would be outlined as follows. The first part of my talk, I'll be talking about the formalism um, and then provide an overview of some of the results that can be shown under this formalism. In the second part of the talk, I will pick one of the main theorem and then provide a, a more detailed sketch of how we establish that proof. In particular, throughout the proof, you can see one way of how knowledge can build up by doing experiments. So let's begin with the first part of the talk. So the first thing we're going to define is what we call a classical agent. So a classical agent, one can think of it as an abstract model for say scientists or classical computers, classical machine learning models, etc. In particular, a classical agent can interact with a physical system that's operating quantum mechanically. You can think of this physical system as, say, the quantum computer you're building, the quantum sensor you're trying to create, or some other kind of um, physical, like, say, a material or some other things. And we assume that this classical agent can conduct experiments and obtain experimental outcomes from the physical system. So in particular, it can specify an instruction for the experiment and then obtain a measurement outcome from, the, uh, from running that experiment. So you can think of it as an interactive protocol between the classical agent and the physical system that allows um, scientists and humans to learn about such a quantum system. So now I'm going to define what I mean by a single experiment. So the first step of the experiment, the classical agent will specify a sequence of actions. So in particular, we're going to focus on this particular form, that is the start from X, followed by Y1 to YL, and then ends with an action Z. So each of these actions corresponds to an action space called Catholic X, Y, and Z. The classical agent, after specifying that action, um, this action will be sent to the physical system, and the physical system will run an experiment based on the action specified by the classical agent. So you can think of it as, for example, what kind of um, gates you're applying or 
what kind of pulse sequence you're going to do, what kind of, uh, what kind of electric signals you're going to send to the physical system in order to control it. So for example, the, the first action X corresponds to how you initialize the physical system. So what kind of initialization process are you going to use? It could be a cooling process, uh, let's say it's a trapping process or something else. But basically, uh, based on what actions you take X, um, the physical system will prepare a quantum many body state, rho X. And then based on what Y1 is, um, the physical system will evolve under some many body dynamics called EY, which is a generally a CPTP map. And then based on what Y2 is, it evolves under EY2 and Y3 and so on. So at the end, it will create some complicated state, which is represented here that corresponds to the final state of the physical system after the sequence of evolutions. So one could think of them as like different gates or different circuits, et cetera. And at the end, um, depending on what Z is, um, the physical system will perform some POVM or a quantum measurement, MZ, that collapses the state and produces a measurement outcome back to the classical agent. So that's what we define as performing one experiment in the classical agent. So typically this measurement outcome would be stochastic, even if you run the same experiment for multiple times. Um, but more generally, we assume that the classical agent can, can conduct different experiments, not just the same experiment um, over and over. So he or she can specify an instruction, obtain the outcome, and based on that outcome, he or she can choose what the next experiment to run and then repeat. So, after multiple rounds of experiments, the classical agent can well start to build knowledge about what this physical system is, what's happening inside the physical system. And the key question we would like to understand is what aspects of the physical system is actually learnable by the classical agent? For example, can a classical agent understand what kind of initial state it's creating? Or can it understand what kind of POVM it's creating, et cetera? Or are there certain aspects of the physical system that's actually unknown to the system. So in order to better understand that question, we have to provide a few more definitions. The first definition is what we call a world model. Basically a world model is uh, a description that encompasses the interaction between the classical agent and the physical system. More precisely, what it, what it defines is just basically how does the action maps to the actual physical operation. So the classical agent will specify an action, like this X, Y, Z, which will correspond to some physical uh, operation, real X, a state preparation, EY, um, an evolution, and MZ, which is a measurement. It's basically a world model just defines how the action specified by the classical agent maps to the true physical operation. So for example, when you say, oh, I wanted to prepare this, I want to do this um, gate, but actually physically what's being implemented is not the gate you're saying, it's some, something else. It's, it's some CPTV map that might be close to the gate or it might be completely wrong. So the world model will specify that. And basically there's going to be a true world model that encompasses the classical agent and the physical system, which is the true correspondence between the action performed by the classical agent and the true physical operation. So that's what we call a W true. That's a true world model. But the classical agent doesn't know what this true world model is. As, as we all are, we don't really know what's the true world model that defines how our action influences the physical system. However, we're going to assume that um, the classical agent has a, a set of candidate world models. So this set could be uncountably large. It could include a lot of things, or maybe perhaps using some prior knowledge from um, other sort of physical models, we can reduce or restrict this set. But nevertheless, we're just going to assume that there is this set of candidate world models, which we call a model class. So this is following the sort of terminology in, in machine learning. For example, people call it hypothesis class or just a class of different models. So that's what model class means. It's, a, it's just a set that contains all the candidate world models, including the true world model. So that's sort of the, the two main uh, definitions we're going to be working with. That is 
we have a true world model and it belongs to this model class, which is just a set of candidate world models. The classical agent knows what this candidate world model is, like what is this set, but it doesn't know what the true world model is. And the goal of the classical agent is under that restriction that W true uh, belongs to Q, it tried to see what kind of aspects about the physical system can be learned. So the first task we're going to look at, which is also the main task we're going to be looking at, is what we call learning intrinsic description. The task here is the following. Given that the true world model belongs to these model class, but it's unknown to the classical Asian, we ask if the classical Asian can learn all the physical operations in the true world model, that is, for each of the action x, y, and z, what is the corresponding row x, e, y, and mz, up to a global unitary or anti-unitary transformation. So this is an important aspect um, that was actually known since like uh, the beginning of quantum mechanics. Um, there's this theorem called Wigner theorem, which says that um, quantum mechanics is, is degenerate in the sense that you can just transform all the, uh, all the operations by a global unitary or anti-unitary transformation and everything will remain unchanged. So basically you can think of that as just um, a basis rotation or changing imaginary number like i to negative i. So that's what anti-unitary means. But basically there is some degeneracy in the description of quantum mechanics. So similar here, we're not going to ask the classical agent to figure out that degeneracy because that's impossible. All we are asking is um, the classical agent to figure out what each of these operations are up to some global basis um, rotation. And the question is, if the classical agent doesn't know any of these physical operations a priori, is it possible for the classical agent to figure out all of them by performing experiments? So to answer this question, we proved the following um, theorem. In particular, we showed that we showed the following positive result. We proved that if a classical agent, um, okay, so we proved that classical agent can learn any world model as long as the unknown actions allows the classical agent to explore the full quantum Hilbert space and perform a non-useless measurement. So what, what we mean by that? Um, the first step, the first condition, explore the full quantum Hilbert space means that by composing the different um, row X and EY, we assume that it's possible for the classical agent to form all kinds of uh, states in the Hilbert space. And the second assumption, perform a non-useless measurement, means that there are at least some measurement procedure, like maybe MZ2, MZ3, and MZ6, such that these measurements actually depends on the state being measured. So what I mean by that is, say, you have a useless measurement, meaning that no matter what state is being measured, it always produces the same outcome or it produces the same distribution of outcome. Then that's a useless measurement because you get no information now. Um, but this statement basically says that as long as you have a single non-useless measurement, that is as long as it somehow very weakly depends on the states being measured, then you can still learn all the other actions by performing experiments in the system. So in the second part of the talk, I will come back to this theorem and show how one can establish the theorem. In particular, you will see that um, how a classical Asian without having any knowledge first can do experiments and start understanding little parts and pieces of the physical systems and then builds up all of its knowledge. But we'll come back to that later. Uh, for now, I wanted to talk about some other more specific examples under different settings. That that's of uh, slightly uh, that that's of um, higher practical relevance. So the first um, case study is try to understand the following question. Suppose we make the same assumption as randomized benchmarking literature. Then what can be learned in the physical system? So usually when one makes that assumption in randomized benchmarking, all you're learning is a single parameter p that describes sort of your gate noise, like. What is the average gate fidelity? How, how noisy is your entire set of, uh, uh, of things? But here we make the same assumption, which is the Clifford gates are subject to the same quantum noise process. 
This is a common assumption in the randomized benchmarking literature. And it proves that if one makes that assumption, then actually all physical operations in your physical systems can be learned. Um, but there's going to be a single unlearnable parameter, which is the fidelity of the initial state. That is, if you have a noisy initial state, then how noisy it is, um, what is this fidelity? You're not going to get that, but, and there's no way you can actually learn that. But other than that, uh, other than that single unlearnable parameter, you can actually learn everything else. So it means that by making the same assumption as randomized benchmarking, you not only just learn the average gate fidelity, under that assumption, you can actually learn everything. And in this, to prove the theorem, we actually give a, a, a simple set of experiments that one could run. And after running that experiments, there's an efficient post-processing that one could do in order to figure out um, all of these physical operations up to this single unlearnable parameter. In particular, um, for learning the noise channel on the Clifford gates, there has actually been uh, prior work on it. Um, that only focuses on learning the noise on the Clifford gates, but not on the other physical operations, like what's your state or what's your measurement, et cetera. In particular, for learning that noise channel, um, our learning algorithm, which is very simple, uses a number of experiments that scales linearly in a number of parameter, which is quadratically faster, uh, uh, quadratically fewer than the best known randomized benchmarking based algorithm, which is this paper, estimating gate state properties from random sequences. Um, which is a very nice paper by Jonas Halsen et al. in the Enzizer's group. So that's sort of a, another very good news. If we make the same assumption as randomized benchmarking, which is kind of a weak assumption, then actually everything can be learned. Now we would like to understand um, when this thing becomes more unlearnable. In particular, is when would the gate noise become unlearnable? So to answer this, we proved the following theorem. We consider a very simple system that is a qubit system. And we assume that one could prepare a perfect initial state, the zero state, and perform a perfect standard basis measurement. However, when one applies the Clifford or T-gate, um, they will be subject to some small poly noise that depends on the gate. So for people that are not familiar with poly noise, it's basically just a probability distribution over whether a bit flip error happens, that's an X error, or a Z error happened, that's a phase error. And whether a both of them happens, that's like a Y error. So you don't know what this um, poly noise is on these different gates, um, but the state and measurements are all perfect. And under this um, condition, under this setting, it actually defines a model class, basically defines a model class on what the physical system actually looks like. We proved that it's not possible for any benchmarking protocol to learn the true poly noise to arbitrarily small error. Basically, there's going to be some fundamental um, lower bound, some fundamental floor to which you can learn the true description of your poly noise. Basically, um, what one could show is that, for example, if you have a head of our gate that's being followed by, say, uh, X error with, high pro uh, with some probability or Z error with some probability, you can actually not distinguish between uh, the two cases. So what it means is that there are various scenarios, there are different physical realities that they're just different because the physical process is different, but through experiments, um, no one can actually distinguish between the two physical reality. Um, and that's because there's going to be, um, actually here, there's going to be a spectrum of physical realities that are just indistinguishable through any experiments. So even if you run an infinite number of experiments, you're not going to be able to understand what's actually happening in the physical system. There are some aspects that's on them. However, a nice thing here is that actually you can learn the amount of noise. You can understand what is the average amount of noise over the different gates. It's just, you cannot understand what's the shape of the noise, but you can understand sort of the magnitude of the noise in the side. So one might ask, what about this a uh, method by Steve Lamia called ACES, Average Circuit Eigenvalue Sampling, which um, proposes a method to learn gate-dependent polynoise. Um, but um, how does that interact with this theorem? Um, basically, in ACES, it assumes perfect stabilizer state. That is, if you can prepare 0, 1, plus, minus, y plus, y minus, all perfectly, then you can learn everything. However, here, we're just assuming that you can prepare um, the zero state perfectly. 
So in that scenario, you would not be able to um, learn everything. So now in the final um, case study, in case study three, um, we would like to understand um, if the noise in your system cannot be learned, could there still be large quantum advantage? And to answer that, we proved the following theorem. We showed that even if the quantum noise cannot be learned, if you have a noisy quantum computer with two qubit gate error epsilon, you can, it can use this noisy quantum computer to do quantum data processing and achieve a learning task um, using, say, unsamples. So like, like in, in machine learning, people usually talk about simple complexity. That is how much data you need. Um, however, we proved that n to the power of roughly 1 over epsilon samples are required classically, meaning that if your epsilon is, say, like 0 0.01, then you get a very, very large polynomial speed up um, in this case, like n, n versus n to the 100, for example. So in particular, the learning task we consider is a task that's been um, um, run on, in, on the Sycamore processor in this paper, Quantum Advantage in Learning from Experiments which is about predicting many properties in a physical system. And we showed that using quantum computer, one could circumvent uncertainty principle. But in that paper, we only prove it for the case of noiseless quantum computer. And we demonstrate that the quantum advantage is still there when we run on a noisy NIST device. But here, using the theorem, we, can, we, we have understand why that's the case, why when we run on a noisy quantum computer, it's still perfect, it's because um, um, fundamentally, theoretically, um, the noise in the system actually doesn't aff affect too much on the advantage in this learning task. So that's the first part. And I will be relatively brief on the second part of the talk. Um, here, I'm just going to go back to this theorem and then briefly show how uh, the classical agent actually, how, how the classical agents start building up knowledge. So at the beginning, the classical agent will have all of these different actions, x1, x2, x3, y1, 1, 2, y3, et cetera. And that corresponds to different physical operations, like row x1, that's unknown to the classical agent, ey1, that's also unknown. All of these are unknown. So at the start, when the classical agent can do this different action, the corresponding physical operation is completely unknown. So it doesn't know anything about what these different um, oper physical operations are. So in order to build knowledge, what we do is the following. Um, in the first step, we will utilize the fact that unitary is the only reversible process to perform unitary testing. So by running experiments, one could test what are the physical operations that are closest to being a unitary. So say we found these three operations to be closest to being unitary. Then what we are going to do is we're going to randomly compose them. We're going to consider that as a set and then randomly compose the operation. And what one could show is that using um, some very nice algebraic geometry kind of operations, um, you can show that by doing this random composition, it will implement a random unitary sample approximately from unitary two design, um, even if you don't know anything about all of these operations. As long as you just keep randomly composing different operation, it will form um, this unitary two design, which means that it's it's like a kind of a pretty uniformly spread out set of unitary on the unitary group. So note that after doing that, we still have no knowledge on what's the composed evolution. All we know is that it's being randomly sampled from unitary two design. So now you get this hard sampler that allows one to randomly sample uh, evolution that's kind of like a random evolution in the unitary space. Now, using that um, unknown random unitary plus an unknown POVM that's non-useless, one can actually create this thing called overlap estimator. That is, given two states, say row x2 and row x3, what we do is the following. We sample a random unitary, apply it onto one of the state, and measure under um, this POVM. And then we do the same for a different state, say row x3 and measure. And we repeat this process for a different random unitary. We sample another random unitary, do this process again. And then after doing these um, experiments for a number of times, we can show that even though we don't know any of these operations, we don't know what row X is, we don't know what E1, E2, E3s are, we don't know what MZ2 is, 
The, together, the data still enables one to estimate the inner product between row X2 and row X3 using um, um, ideas from randomized measurements. So now, even though we don't know anything, we can still create this overlap estimate there. And this starts to allow the classical agent to know something about the physical operation. At least it can start knowing the geometry of the quantum states. Still has no idea what the measurements are and what the CPTP maps are, but at least at this point, it can see sort of the geometry of the physical system, uh, of the quantum state. Now the step four is one compose all of these different um, states and CPTP maps to form all kinds of states and then utilize this overlap estimator to understand the geometry. And basically what one should do here is to find a set of states that satisfy some special geometry using this overlap estimator. The geometry is kind of complicated and it's shown to the right. It basically just says, I want the inner product to be, um, to be, to be zero or to be one half or to be one third or be two third and, and so on. So it's just a set of geometry that one wants to satisfy. And after satisfying that geometry, what one could show is that the set of states that's being found um, has to be of the following form. It must be uh, first there's a D of the basis and then superposition of two bases and plus superposition of three basis states. So these three basis states are very important um, because you need those in order to fix the geometry, like basically the relative face information between these kind of states. Um, otherwise, you don't know if they are um, they are really like um, having an I or just one here, et cetera. So now with that special set of states at hand and the overlap estimator at hand, one could perform quantum state tomography um, in order to learn all the other states. And then similarly, you can utilize these operations that one, these knowledge that one builds up in order to do quantum process tomography to learn all of these. And finally, to perform quantum POVM measurement tomography to learn all the measurements. So together, one can see that through these long sequence of experiments, um, the classical agent can start without knowing any of the physical operation, but still learn all of the physical operations by just doing experiments and try to um, understand the structure. So to conclude, um, in this work, we develop a theory for understanding what can be learned from noisy quantum experiments. In various settings, learning is possible and can be done efficiently. However, um, I think we are still at the beginning of having a nice theory on understanding these aspects. So I do believe that our understanding is still far from complete. And there is still a lot of things to do um, in order to better understand um, the learning aspects of experiments. And in the, in the paper, we also shown some other results in order to build better intuition. For example, we have more examples of systems that are unlearnable. We also have um, results about predicting extrinsic behavior. That is, instead of learning all the physical operation in your system, what if we only care about learning an effective model of the physical system such that one can predict what would happen under different experiments? So that's what we mean by predicting extrinsic behavior. And we also have several um, nice results um, discussing that. So that's it for my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, Xin Yuan. Yeah, uh, I have a small question. It seems like your algorithm depends on how, uh, whether you can form a two unitary two design. Yes. So does that uh, does that mean that uh, the system is unlearnable if you cannot have a unitary two design formed by the operations? That's a great question. So 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 this theorem is just um, sort of a sufficient condition for you being able to. Uh, that characterize whether you can learn everything. So, so it's possible that if you don't satisfy um, these criteria, you can still learn everything. So this is just one condition, I would say, oh, that nice. such that one could, yeah, learn everything. So, mm -hmm. so to be honest, like, um, like for example, in 
some of the case studies, like um, say say this one, uh, because the clipper gates are subject to noise. Um, you might like if the noise is kind of high, then you might not be able to um, really form a, a unitary design because the, the noise is high, so you cannot really explore it mm -hmm. too well um, because of the noise in your system. But yet here you can see that um, you can still learn everything up to a single unlearnable parameter. So, so I think understanding what kind of scenarios um, is actually learnable and, and not, I think it's still very open at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not entirely sure what's the right picture in order to understand when, when things are learnable and when things are not learnable. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, but, but this theorem is just a, a sufficient condition for learnability, but you can have other conditions which can be say incomparable to this one. Um, that's still okay. Meaning that it's possible that you doesn't, it doesn't form, you cannot form a two design, but yet you can still learn everything. Yeah, I see. Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay, uh, great. I think oh, let's move on to the next speaker. But uh, Robert, there is a question in the chat, so feel free to uh, just. Yeah, I'll, I'll just reply through chat. And thank you again for the talk.